Tonight, killed execution style. New details about the six American medical volunteers gunned down in cold blood in Afghanistan. I'm Anthony Mason. Also tonight, the end could be in sight in the Gulf as BP is set to finally seal the well. Turbulent Times, an exhibition of famous photographs from the civil rights era, focuses on the bravery of the men who took the pictures. And check out the singing supermarket clerk who's one of Malibu's brightest stars. to the positive. This is the CBS Evening News with Russ Mitchell. Good evening. Russ Mitchell is off tonight. The bodies of 10 Western aid workers massacred by the Taliban will return to Kabul today as Afghan police revealed the 10, including six Americans, had been lined up and shot one by one. The team had just finished a mission to deliver free medical aid to remote northern regions of Afghanistan and was traveling back to Kabul when it was ambushed after a picnic. Mandy Clark has the latest tonight from Kabul. The bodies of the aid workers arrived back to Kabul, where friends and families identified their remains. Early examination suggests most were killed execution style, though at least one was shot in the back, perhaps in an attempt to run away. All the bodies will be repatriated, except for the team leader, Tom Little. He wanted to be buried here, where he's done his life's work as an eye doctor. It's a family decision, our girls. I felt that should happen, that he gave his life in Afghanistan, and that's where we were called to as a family, and that's where he will be buried. Little and his wife Libby spent most of the last 35 years in Afghanistan throughout the Soviet invasion, the Civil War, and under the Taliban government. Tom has been in pretty tight spots before, but um, it didn't deter his sense that this is what God made him for. <laughs> Little had invited Dr. Karen Wu to join him on the ill-fated trip to the Taliban-dominated province of Nuristan to provide basic medical care. All she wanted to do was help. Uh, and a lot of the time she would, you know, very much forget about herself because there were other people that needed assistance. A Colorado dentist, Thomas Grams, was part of the team. He had quit his dental practice to volunteer full-time, giving free dental care to impoverished children. Another team member was Glenn Lapp from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a nurse who had helped victims of Hurricane Katrina and Rita. And 32-year-old Cheryl Beckett from Tennessee was also killed. She had been working in Afghanistan for six years. The Taliban quickly claimed responsibility for the attack on the 12-member team, who, like other aid workers, traveled without private security. We have a no-arms uh, policy, uh, and we do that because we believe our security is actually much more in our context with the local community. Tom went there on the invitation of the local community. Today in Brunswick, New York, people came together to mourn his passing. There will be several memorials here, too, in Kabul for Tom Little. It will be a chance for the Afghan people to give thanks to a man who dedicated his life to helping theirs. Anthony. Mandy Clark in Kabul tonight. Thanks, Mandy. Elsewhere in Afghanistan, the military command says three American soldiers were killed yesterday in the south, along with two Danish soldiers. And in Iraq, a U.S. soldier was reported killed yesterday south of Baghdad. Here at home, the end of the Gulf oil well crisis may finally be at hand. BP could take its next step toward a so-called bottom kill of the well as early as tonight. Mark Strassman is watching the preparations in Grand Isle, Louisiana tonight. Mark. Oh, good evening, Anthony. BP may be ready to resume drilling that relief well, but distrust of BP has never stopped around here. And the new worry is that BP is now ready to declare victory and go home. So little oil now floats in the Gulf, BP has had nothing to recover for more than a week. On the surface, this disaster seems over. Clearly, we feel like it, it's moving to a new phase. A phase that to Patrick Shea sounds like a quick BP getaway. It's corporate greed. They want to get the hell out of here. They want to be off the, the front page. On Grand Isle, Louisiana, Shea built a mock cemetery to the victims of BP's leak. His closed restaurant is one of them. They haven't made us whole. They haven't even made us half. But BP's operations have been a windfall for local charter captains and fishermen. 
At its peak, BP had 7,000 boats on its payroll. With the well now capped, BP is cutting its ties with most of them. Problem is, says marina owner Bill Butler, most of them have grown spoiled by big BP paydays. Well, I just tell them, just put their money in a cookie jar and put it in the ground, you know, and then and save it for a rainy day because you're going to need it. New government estimates say one-fourth the total spill, 52 million gallons, is still out there somewhere. That's roughly five times the size of the Exxon Valdez disaster. Along the Gulf, people want their coastline and their futures cleared up. And you feel that, and that, uh, that's horrible, it's terrible, and that's why we've got to be here for the long term. Don't tell me, show me. Show me. You, trust has to be built and earned, and they haven't showed that in the least yet. The new high anxiety in the Gulf, with the spill now over, will people here be forgotten? We've got a commitment to be there. BP is responsible. We are going to hold them accountable. BP has about 100 feet down left to drill on his main relief well and could be ready to intercept the broken well, the bottom kill, by next weekend. Anthony? Good news. Mark Strassman, thanks. Maybe it's because of the struggling economy, but last year more Americans filed for Social Security than ever before, a record two and three quarter million people. On top of that, more chose to take early retirement and reduced benefits. As a result, Social Security is facing the first shortfall ever this year. And today, House Republican leader John Boehner said it's time to think about moving the retirement age to 70. Republican leaders are also making an election year push for immigration reform, calling for changes to the Constitution's 14th Amendment. As chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford explains, it could alter who's allowed to call themselves a U.S. citizen. For most, the path to citizenship is long and hard, with years of waiting and work to say their country is America. But there is another route to citizenship for the next generation of immigrants. They can enter the country illegally or fly in on a tourist visa to have a baby. If someone here is illegally and they have a child, that child is automatically granted U.S. citizenship. Senator Lindsey Graham and other Republican leaders want to challenge that by changing the 14th Amendment of the Constitution so babies born to foreigners in the United States are not automatically granted citizenship. There are schemes along the border. You pay $2,500 to $5,000. They will sneak you across the border. They will take you to an American hospital, deliver your baby, and that child automatically becomes a citizen. But civil rights groups say Republicans are playing politics. It's being raised to pander to those in the country who have fears about changes in the demographic composition of America. As of 2008, 3.8 million illegal immigrants living in America have children who are U.S. citizens. That's an increase from five years earlier, when there were only 2.8 million. But that's only part of it. Wealthy foreigners are coming here to have a child and then going back with a baby that's forever a U.S. citizen. In China, you can buy U.S. citizenship for your child for a mere $20,000. CBS News found several Shanghai-based websites selling birth tours, complete with airfare, visas, and the medical cost of delivery. This website has pictures of private maternity homes and Chinese-speaking doctors in the U.S. Senator Graham says changing the 14th Amendment is worth debating as part of overall immigration reform. It would not affect the children who already are here. But legal experts say that the hurdles to changing the Constitution are so high that it's not likely to happen. Jan Crawford, CBS News, Washington. Wild weather drove through the Midwest this weekend, leaving a splintered path of destruction. Tornadoes slammed parts of North Dakota and Minnesota, where a storm chaser recorded one violent twister as it spun across the countryside. The tornado well, hit and exploded bad. a farmhouse, ripping it to pieces. People. Remarkably, no injuries are reported. Torrential rains triggered mudslides in a town in northwest China, killing more than 100 residents in the homes below. More than 1,000 others are missing, and more rain is in the forecast. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, can-do inventors who say they can't get their patents quickly enough. With unemployment still stalled at 9.5%, hopes for improvement rest on small business, which historically accounts for two-thirds of all new jobs. New products could jumpstart a recovery, but just try getting a patent. 
Here's business and economics correspondent Rebecca Jarvis. What you get is what's shown here on our George. Okay. Eldo Di Bellardino invented spec sunglasses in an office that. above his garage in Virginia Beach. They provide you goggle-like protection, but they And he's ready to sell them. Trouble is, Di Bellardino doesn't have a patent. I have very limited ability to defend myself in the marketplace against copy activity. Copycats are something he knows well. Eight years ago, his first commercial venture won a patent. This was my escape ladder product. But a large company produced a knockoff. He won a multi-million dollar lawsuit for patent infringement, but in return had to sign away the rights to his invention. So we need a system that's quicker. Instead, we got a system that takes years. The average wait for patent review is three years. That's largely due to a backlog of 700,000 applications. Three million one hundred. Patent Office 000. Director David Capo says speeding up the process will help the economy. The backlog is indeed our biggest problem. It represents innovations trapped in this agency that otherwise could be creating jobs. Cabos wants to cut the wait time from 36 to 20 months and the backlog in half. But he needs more money to hire 1,200 additional patent examiners and update computers. It's no taxpayer dollars at all. All of the fees that we collect come from patent applicants. But the agency's hands are tied by Congress, which limits the fees to $500 for individuals and $1,000 for corporations and diverts $200 million of patent revenue to other budget items. We'd be willing to pay a significantly higher fee in order to fund the patent office correctly. To Sarah, a Silicon Valley company that makes cell phones and camera components has hundreds of patents. Several thousand dollars actually uh, as far as a patent cost to us is you know relatively immaterial. All we need is resources in order to uh, operate this agency in a business-like fashion. Uh, Aldo Di Bellardino says he can't Just afford like to wait. He plans to start yeah, selling specs yes. this summer. I'm taking a big risk, but the reality is I have no other choice. By the time the patent would possibly issue, my, my opportunity window could close. Daddy and like any entrepreneur, he's Daddy hoping Daddy that Daddy along with the risk Daddy. will come the rewards. Sure Rebecca smiley? Jarvis, You're CBS News, tomorrow. Virginia Beach. And just ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, photographs that help change a nation. Nearly half a century ago, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. Now a new exhibition is featuring the work of photographers who sometimes braved mobs to highlight the struggle for equal rights. For 14 years, they marched and sat in, protesting a system of segregation. And through it all, Bob Edelman was there. I was deeply, deeply moved. I, I remember tearing up reading about how the young people were, were involved. As a young photographer, Edelman volunteered to take pictures for civil rights groups. He documented voter registration drives and freedom rides, often finding it difficult to be a passive observer. They were getting pushed around and beat up, and uh, I jump in. <laughs> try and help them, and I had to learn that that wasn't what I was supposed to do. It's a lesson he remembered May 4th, 1963, in Birmingham, Alabama, producing what Edelman considers his proudest picture, a huddled group of young protesters braving violent streams of water. They were intent on standing up. It was a great, great moment. Edelman was soon joined by dozens of others, Photojournalists like Charles Moore, James Madison, and Jack Franklin, most on special assignment for national magazines. But Gene Roberts, author of The Race Beat, says it was the wire service cameramen who made the difference. The day-by-day -day movement of pictures on the front pages across America really had impact. Robert says movement leaders knew the powerful images of injustice were vital and remembers a scolding Martin Luther King Jr. gave a black photographer who tried to help young protesters. And we don't need another civil rights worker. We need photographers. And because you forgot your real mission and tried to, to help 
the kids, the world missed an image. But getting those pictures was not only challenging, it was often dangerous. Toward the end, I drove with a gun in my uh, car. I mean, because it was, I, I gotten pretty nervous and paranoid. Edelman's work, along with that of 19 other notable civil rights photographers, is now part of a permanent exhibit called Road to Freedom. Only 10 of the photographers are still alive. It's a very now 79, document. Edelman says documenting those turbulent times gave his life purpose. These people were not being treated fairly, so the pictures had to tell that. I had one eye in the viewfinder and the other eye in history. The Road to Freedom exhibition remains on view at New York's Bronx Museum until the 29th of this month. We'll be right back. Finally tonight, if you don't like to shop for groceries, then you aren't shopping at Ralph's in Malibu. Bill Whitaker explains why there's singing in the aisles. Malibu, California, home to some of Hollywood's biggest stars, but one of Malibu's most popular celebrities won't be found on the beach. She's in a grocery store. And you know I'm gonna treat you right. You give me fever. For nearly 34 years, Ralph's supermarket clerk, Deborah Carraway, has been singing for customers. This old man came rolling home. She should be on Broadway, not in the grocery store. Until it seems At the register. You had gone dark. In the grocery aisle, you know she knows how to please an audience. Accent. To wait the positive. This is my stage right here. My this own is your person. stage. That's right. This is where and I this do is my your spotlight. This is my spotlight. And that's Deborah where first where began belting out tunes back. when she was working on cleanup duty. Her bluesy style soon caught on with shoppers. They would start saying things to me like, you know, I was in a bad mood until I heard you sing. When Deborah's not singing, she's <laughs> dishing out compliments. How you pretty ladies doing today? How you doing, handsome? Come on and down. lots of hugs. Mm -hmm. Love you. It's something about her that's infectious. It, you, you just like to be around people like that. Her number one fan, actor Dick Van Dyke. Everybody, have you heard? Yeah. He's gonna buy me a mockingbird. No, and she lightens everybody's day when it comes. She knows everybody. Everybody in town knows her. And besides that, she's hot. <laughs> but for someone so full of life, life hasn't been easy. She lives modestly, an hour from the glitz of Malibu. Time for your medicine. She takes care of her ailing mother, a double stroke survivor. She's lost four of her eight brothers, had to raise her son on her own. <laughs> but none of that deters Deborah from her mission, spreading joy. Everybody loves love. Everybody wants love. And so I plan to keep on doing it. I see no reason to stop. So shop around amid the patrons and the produce. You just might find the best long running show in town. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Malibu. And that's the CBS Evening News. Later on CBS 60 Minutes. I'm Anthony Mason in New York. Katie Couric will be here tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Good night. On television, online, and on the go. CBS News, the most powerful reporting anywhere.